welcome to the 2023 Beach University. I want to just take a second before we begin. I know you've been looking out at this beautiful beach and our beautiful morning. So um, enjoy this presentation today. My name is Steve Levy. I'm a volunteer with the Beach Ambassador Program here at Siesta Key. Just so you know, Beach University started. an environmental education component of our own Beach Ambassador program. Now, sitting here today is the person who started that program 17 years ago. He and his wife, Bruce and Joyce Broadbell, started this. And I want to thank Bruce and his wife. And Bruce, where are you? There he is, right there. Thank you, and it's been running strong for 17 years. Um, I also want to thank Kathleen Wunderlich, who is the Siesta Key Events Coordinator. She's back there. Um, she organized this and organized the speakers and set up everything. So thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm going to thank our camera person, Sammy Chido, uh, for making this available on Sarasota County Facebook page, which you can go home and watch this later on. A lot of you have already gotten one of the handouts for today's program, um, pages to take notes, evaluations up front. Evaluations are very important for our program because when you come out, it gives us information for future programs and topics we may want to use. Um, I appreciate all of you attending once again on this beautiful morning on CSD Key. One last thing, we have t-shirts, t-shirts, great t-shirts available, Catherine's back there, I think the t-shirts are on the way out, and you can uh, buy a t-shirt for uh, $15. Uh, I now like to introduce Jonathan, but before I do, when he speaks today, you need to listen carefully, because at the end of his presentation, I'm going to be asking three questions. And uh, you can answer any prizes that you have. Uh, so, listen carefully. Let me introduce now Jonathan Pointer. In North Carolina, Jonathan Pointer packed his young family and everything they owned in a 15 foot truck and a Honda Civic in 2002 and drove it to Florida for an interview his wife had for a potential job. She ended up getting the job and they moved out of a Howard Johnson hotel. Things have a way of working out, especially here in Florida. It's sunnier, warmer, and full of potential goodness. Jonathan ended up finding a great place to work too. He's been in Sarasota County, he's been in Sarasota County for 18 years and currently serves as the Siesta Beach Coordinator. The role has him working with all things beaches. Everything from events, volunteers, and conservation to administration, capital improvements, and restoration projects keep him busy. Growing up surfing and sailing has inspired his deep, deep affinity for the ocean and now the beaches of Florida. He desires to share with you today a message, a message of hope and optimism as we learn about all about our beautiful shoreline. He invites you to discover something new about your beaches and what you can do to help ensure they're around for many years to come for everyone to enjoy. With great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Jonathan with today's presentation, Doc Sand. Well, welcome to the first class of Beach Uter, Beach University. You got me. <coughs> Professor Pointer, Professor P. I'd like to say thank you to Catherine for setting all this up. Done a great job, my lab assistant. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Beach U. Thanks, Bruce, for getting this started. Beach University. I will say this is not, uh, I'll make a disclaimer, this is not an actual university, I'm not an actual <laughs> professor, okay? Um, but hopefully you'll learn something today. I will say that this 
University, though, I guarantee you won't incur student debt. Today we're going to talk all about the beaches. We're going to talk all about sand. You're going to find out where it comes from, where it's going, why it's so valuable, what we can do to protect it, how it affects the ecosystem. The class is going to be fun. It's going to be a little interactive, so I hope you enjoy today. Now, let's see. Do you remember building sand castles when you were little? Sure. And you know, we out here in November we have the, the we have the we have the crystal plastic. Have you ever been here for that? Yeah. This is this is like a professional sand sculpting contest. And this sand is actually really great for building sand castles. Does anybody know why that might be? Okay, it's actually it's actually made a, you know, the sand here is very special. It's 100% quartz. It's actually very, when you, when you compact, it actually makes great um, for building sand castles. So right now it's dry, it's nice and fluffy, it's great for volleyball tournaments. But when it gets wet, it actually becomes more like concrete. So it's very nice for sand sculpting. And when people, when you come out and you see the giant sand sculptures that they build, people say, well, how... What are you putting in there, right? And they're saying, well, we're basically sprayed with water, but they're convinced that somehow they're putting some sort of adhesive or glue in there. And people really love this sand here. They, you know, they want to take it home with them. You know, we actually have caught people, like, with wheelbarrows and trying to tote this stuff off, and then they actually, like, market it and try to sell it on the internet. Yeah, it happens. So we have, um, so we have a... And actually, we have an ordinance now that prevents you from basically chopping, taking, taking the trees out of the parks, take, and, and sand is part of that too. So when you steal the sand from from the beach here, it's you know you're it's it's against the county ordinance. But more than that, it's taken it's taken away from the public. Now you look at this and you say this has got to be an infinite source of sand. And maybe when you're maybe when you're building sand castles, you think, okay, this sand goes on forever. You know how a lot of this sand takes off from here? It leaves on your feet. <laughs> it leaves on your bags when you get in the car, right? Uh, and we do have showers and you brush it off and everything like that. But, but people, um, they'll want to come and take the sand, so we have an ordinance against stealing um, the sand. You can look it up. It's chapter 90 um, uh, for the ordinance for parks. You know, over in Jamaica, I learned this, and, and I've done a lot of research, and this is just stuff that I've researched about sand. But in Trelawney, Jamaica, 2008, maybe you heard this story, a whole beach was actually stolen. Yeah, so, in the middle of the night, 500 dump trucks or so came, and it was a beautiful white sandy beach. They came and backed up dump trucks and used back hose and, and filled up trucks and they took it off the site. And nobody could really figure out where the sand went. But people had suspicions of where it went because there was new resorts being built. So they went up in helicopters and they tried to find out where these where this sand went. Now I'm talking about a massive amount of sand left this beach. There were trenches like 10 feet deep on this beach. And you went down in them, you couldn't get back up. So this was a massive amount of sand in Trelawney, Jamaica that, that disappeared. Now when they went up in a helicopter, they could see beaches of new resorts that were being built that used to have brown sand, but now all of a sudden they had white sand. You know, so they had their suspicions that it went to new resorts that were being built. There were no big piles. There were, um, you know, it was spread out, basically. The sand was spread out. And there was different witnesses that maybe could attest to it, but they actually received death threats. So if you look this story up, they, you know, the case was never settled. And, you know, the sand industry is a $250 billion a year industry. So sand is very valuable. It's worth, now we know it's being stolen. They're sand mafias. So we know that sand is very valuable. Now, it's a warning toward, it's a warning that 
that sand had become worth stealing. It had become worth smuggling. Now, if you were to try to prove where the sand came from on the new beaches, you'd have to have sand forensics, wouldn't you? To try to catch the criminals. If you were to help this case, what would you be looking for? How would you try to prove that the sand would come there? You know, they hired sedimentologists and marine geologists to try to prove that the sand on the new beach came from the stolen beach. You might ask, where did it come from? Does anybody have an idea where sand comes from? The mountains, that's a great, you're, you're right, the sand does come from mountains. Matter of fact, you know, this siesta is 100% quartz. Over a millennial of time, they came, it, it has migrated down from the Appalachian Mountains. And a lot of that has stopped now because there's so many dams in the way of the Appalachian Mountains and, and the, uh, the Gulf Coast there. But yeah, a lot of it came from the mountains. Where else would sand come from? Seashells. Crushed shells, exactly. Dead reefs, yeah, exactly. It comes from that. So it comes from silicate, granite, marine gr mineral grains, or now even plastic. Right? So you're sitting out there and you think you're sitting in, in granite and, and mineral grains and crushed shells, but you're sitting in little bit pieces of crushed up plastic too, aren't you? So sand is um, it's, it's a composition that we look at. There's size, sorting, color. There's all kinds of things. How would you sort sand? So I have a, I have a, I have a handout there. Hopefully you got it. Steve, maybe you could pass it out to people that, that, that still need it. So another term for sand is called aggregate. If maybe you're familiar with the construction industry, right? They say different aggregate. So if we look at the first is the Wentworth grain scale. So you're gonna learn a lot about sand today. This is one of the things. Now the Wentworth grain scale is basically set up so like every, okay, you can look, mud is the finest, then there's silt, then there's sand, and then there's gravel. So these are the particle size. How, what's the size of the grain and the thing we're looking at, right? So um, this is terminology that's used in the construction industry to my understanding and, and, and building and that sort of thing. Well, sand, you can see there, is between 0 0.0265 and 2 millimeters. Now, if you look at the left-hand side millimeters there, the Wentworth scale is basically set up so that every grain Above is basically two times bigger, and every grain below is basically a half a size smaller. So it basically doubles every size you go up there. So if you were a sedimentologist, a marine geologist, if you were working for a construction company, you might look at these sorts of things and decide, what is, a, what is what's the size of the, the grain that we're looking at? Another thing that we could look at is the, is the Mohs hardness scale. So you see there on the Mohs hardness scale that talc. Talc can be very soft. You can crush it probably. Your fingernails, right? That's two. Your fingernails there, it kind of gives you different things on the right hand side, common objects that you might look at and to associate with the different mineral grains there. So you got gypsum, calcite, fluorite, I can't even pronounce some of these. Appetite looks like um, quartz, topaz, diamond being the hardest. So I mentioned earlier, what's the, what are the grains out at Siesta made of? Quartz. Quartz, okay. You know, it, a number of years ago, 1999 or somewhere back then, it, it received the designation of some of the finest and whitest sand. And you'll see that even actually on a, left over on some of the publications. Like the uh, chamber promotes that a lot. It says the, I think that might even be in their logo, the Siesta Key Chamber, the finest and whitest sand. Well, you see how hard the, the quartz grains are uh, compared to some of the other crushed shells or mineral deposits and that sort of thing. So we're not too far off from diamonds. 
Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I have your question. What would a seashell be? What do you guys think? <coughs>
we're getting it from where, we're, where it's an approved source, and we're getting the closest thing to it. But people are very particular about their sand, right? The cool thing about this quartz sand is that you can walk on it in the hottest part of the day, and it doesn't burn your feet. I, I agree with that guy. I wish we could get more siesta sand and put it on the pathways, okay? But the bottom line is we couldn't. We got what we were able to get, okay? So you have to consider that when beach erosion occurs, sometimes you can't get it back. It's gone. You know, when they were building Siesta Beach here, I was present. They dug down 25 feet over there. There's like at the south end of the park. And guess what? 25 feet down, it was still that white Siesta sand. It was beautiful, right? But it's, it's trapped here now. So, um, so I want you to consider that it, all sand is not the same. So we're going to play a little game here. Gonna, um, how many miles of Sarasota coastline are there? Do you know? 31? You're very close. 35. Okay, how many miles of Florida coastline? 2,000. Lower? 1,500. We got 825 miles of Florida coastline. Now, did you guys know that Siesta Beach here was just rated by TripAdvisor, I think, number two this year? We keep getting awards, and some other beaches in Sarasota County have got some awards, too. How many passes? Do you know what a pass is? A pass is that thing that goes between the islands and the water's rushing through and there's current. How many passes in Sarasota? Three. Three, right? It's pretty. <laughs> you got that one. Uh, there's New Pass, there's Big Pass, there's like North Jetty right down there. Um, you might start to think of some of the other passes, but I think they're outside the county. There, keep in mind, there used to be four passes in Sarasota County, right? What was the fourth one? Oh, now we're, now we're talking about something, you know? Uh, okay, so how many passes are there on the Florida Gulf Coast? There's 36 passes, give or take. Now, why do I say give or take? Because sometimes they open up and sometimes they close. Midnight Pass is a great example of a, of, a, of, a, of a pass that closed over time. It closed naturally over time. Um, so, I have some sand here. And I want you to take a minute and come up here and look. The sand comes from different places on the county here. Here's your choices. So this is the interactive part. This is where you get to get up and come look at the sand and decide what number, where did that sand come from in the county? Please, come up, do that, right? Write down on just number, number on your paper, one through seven, and decide what, where did that sand come from? Anybody, please, yes, come up. This is the interactive part. Around maybe 
after we're, after they guess. size, the scale, the color, the shape, and just right here in Sarasota County you can see that there's different sand at these beaches. So I want to give you the correct um, layout here of what these, where this sand came from. And we're going to try to get it back to the right location, but uh, Longboat was number one. Venice was number two. Nokomis number three. Lido was four. That was kind of confusing because it was so white. Uh, Casperson was five, Siesta was six, and Turtle was seven. Anybody get any right? Nobody got any right? You didn't even get Siesta right? What? Wow. Okay. See how confusing it can be and why? Why it um, might be hard to determine where the sand came from? Why is sand so different? Well, it, it originates in different locations. And I did have a question while we were doing this exercise. Somebody came up to me and said, well, is it, how far out does the crystal, the, do the, the, the crystal sands go out here? And I said, well, not too far. It's like a crescent. It's like a bowl here. We're going to kind of get into that. But if you go out there, it turns into mud. You can't just dredge it up and put it on Siesta Beach. It doesn't, doesn't exist out there. You think you can go out there and, and vacuum it up and put it on the beach, and, but it, it doesn't exist so much. Um, so the sand comes from different places, the Appalachians, the Gulf Coast. Um, it comes from quarries. It comes from rivers. Um, you know, a lot of environmental, environmental degradation is happening when we pull sand out of these locations. When you pull in sand out of rivers and beaches, and then, of course, um, the dams release uh, water periodically, and more sand can come out of come out of those. I want to let you know that sand is always on the move. It's a dance of fluctuation. The sand is always coming and going. Right now, in, a, in an island environment, ideally, the sand is blows this way. It blows off the beach, right, and it goes onto the backside of the island, and the island kind of builds that way, right. That's how kind of the keys were formed, right? But then what happens when we build and develop all along the coastline and we harden the structures, right? The island, the island doesn't move around as much anymore. So you never, you never walk onto the same beach twice. Think about that. You never walk onto the same, no matter how many times you've been here or whatever your favorite beach is, you never walk on the same beach twice because it's constantly move, moving. It's ebbing and flowing. And why do some of the passes, like, look at Dunedin Pass up there. That's another one that closed up. It's um, between Clearwater and Caladesi Island, okay? And that, um, that closed up around 1985 through Hurricane Elena. But before that, they built a bridge over there, okay? Now, when they built that bridge, it changed how the sediment started flowing in that area. And it, it changed how the sand moved around, which is one reason why it started clogging up that, clogging up that pass. And now, today, Caladesi Island is no longer, it's an island, but it's not an island, right? Because it doesn't, there's no pass there around it anymore. You can actually walk up Clearwater Beach to Caladesi Island, right? So the same thing happens at these different passes. Did you know New Pass, which is between, which is between Lido and, Longboat, right? Uh, that opened up in, in 18, like 48 or something with a hurricane. Um, and that was new at the time, so the name stuck, New Pass. Now, there's, there's actually longshore currents that, that flow along the Gulf Coast here. So think about like a river of water running down the whole Gulf, down the whole Gulf, Gulf Coast. And it's flowing, and there's sand in that river. 
And sometimes it's getting deposited on different beaches. It's coming and going, it's ebbing and flowing. And this river, like, yeah. let's say... Uh, skyscrapers, that's what does it. more skyscrapers. <laughs> that's a great point. Skyscrapers, think, think about it. Skyscrapers are actually, are filled with, filled with sand from construction, right? So when you see skyscrapers, they're actually the world's largest sand castles. Think about that, right? So he, he has a point there. But back to rivers flowing and ebbing and flowing, right? Now, uh, we, we build things, man-made structures to kind of slow down that river, right? So you have, you have groins. You know what? A groin is like rocks that come out perpendicular to the shore and we cover it. We just built, they just built two groins over at Lido when we, their beach was re-nourished, right? It was designed to kind of slow the sand down flowing from north to south. And what used to take five years to come into the big pass there will probably now take 10 years, okay? It's still going to migrate south, but it won't be as fast. We also build hardened structures like jetties. You can see that down at North Jetty. Now you can see what actually happens to the channel and the water when you build jetties, right? And then we also build um, seawalls, which are hardened structures like this. Uh, if that's the water, then it you know, runs parallel to the water. And to, to gentleman's point, we also do a lot of development. So there's, there's these things that affect the flow and natural movement of sand. And I want to tell you that what you do on your beach will definitely affect your neighbor's beach. Okay? I just put it that way because sand is ever moving around. If you say, we want to protect our sand, we're going to go get all this sand and put it here. And, and then we're going to put jetties and groins and seawalls and things like that to try to protect it, it will affect down the downstream flow of sand. So you have to consider that whenever you want to do um, re-nourishment projects and different things like that. So there are many forces acting upon sand. So there's, there's ice, there's H2O, there's water, there's wind, there's waves, there's currents, there's time. So all these things are affecting sand. What do you think sand is used for? This is another interactive part of the course. I want you to turn to four or five people right around you and discuss just for two minutes. Say hello to your neighbor. Hi, I'm glad you're here. And say, what do you think sand is used for in society, in, in the world? This is the interactive part. Talk to your neighbor. Structures. I, I just wanted to touch on this for a second, but there's there's hardened um, there's hard engineering where it's like rocks and jetties and seawalls and things like that. But there's also soft engineering where we pump sand onto the beach or or truck sand onto the beach, and then we um, also put up like sand fences, like little wooden stakes to try to keep the sand from moving around so much. And then we also uh, maybe we plant a dune line. So there's different things like that, some soft engineering things that we also try to do. Um, but okay, so what what is sand used for? What did what'd you come up with? Glass. Does everybody have a cell phone, right? Right? You got you got sand on you on you right now. Uh, your your glasses that you're wearing, everything glass. Think about it. What you're drinking out of, your windshields in your car, um, the windows in your house comes from comes from silicate, right? From sand. What else? Concrete. Concrete. You know, 
80% of concrete is sand, is from what I read, and 95% of asphalt is sand. Think about that. You know, China has been building so much in the past, you know, couple decades that basically what they built in like 20 years, you know, we <laughs> we didn't use enough sand for like 150 years here. It's just it's going so fast that we're we're building um we're extracting enough sand every um, from from the planet every year to build a wall that's 89 feet tall and 89 feet wide and wrap around the, the earth. That's how much sand we're extracting from the planet for um, these different things. What else? Filtration. Filtration, that's exactly right. Um, I, I have that one down here. Filtration for water systems, septic systems, and swimming pools even, right? So, um, yeah, sand is definitely used for that. What else? Boundary. Boundary. You are brilliant, sir. Foundries to, uh, to form molds for uh, metal objects. You're exactly right. Foundries. So, <coughs> what else? Golf <laughs> Yeah, golf courses for sure. Um, so we have sand volleyball courts. We have sand for... <coughs> Man, did anybody get red tie? I mean, I didn't say that, did I? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's also like equestrian, uh, that's very specialized sand, they, they tint it, they dye it, they polish it, so the horses can jump and stuff, think about that, you know, they save it up for a year, then they bring it back, you know the sand for like the volleyball Olympics, that stuff is like super exclusive, right, they, they bring it from a foundry, they make it special for the US, for, for the Olympics, you know, because if you dive in the sand, you know, if it's too hard, you might break your fingers. You might pull a hammy. So there's all kinds of things like this, but, and the sand needs to drain water very quickly. So it can pour on the Olympic sand, and it just dissipates, right? So there's, there's sand for use for all kinds of things. I also have down here oil and gas drillers, like sandblasting, that sort of thing as well. So I don't know if you came up with that one. Polishing. And the, Polishing, exactly, yeah. So sand is used for all kinds of things and also fortification of the shoreline, right? We pile sand up here. So it's actually kind of like a miracle material. And you know, it's, it's the second use, it's the second most used material, right, that we're seeking after, other than the first one, which is what? Water. Water and then sand. Sand is vital and you never knew how much sand is worth. Okay? You just come to the beach, you see it, it but sand is, takes an extremely long time to make and it's very valuable. It's very valuable. You know, like we, um, <laughs> and sand, sand projects, they, they're very expensive and they take a long time. You know, just consider like, you know, maybe you remember the old siesta and it was, we redeveloped this whole place here and it cost, it was a $21 million project. It took like two years or so to build. It's fantastic, the amenities that we have now. But you know what, a year, during the same time, we re-nourished Turtle Beach. And that cost $20 million. Wow. And then, a few years later, a couple storms later, guess what we have to do again? Re-nourish Turtle Beach, right? You've been down there, it just drops off like a... And we actually have a CIP project right now going, trying to get trucks to come, and maybe you've read about that a little bit. But again, it's very difficult. You have to pull sand from the middle of the state, and and you have to have a lot, 100 dump trucks and 100 dump truck drivers, and you know it's it's very costly. It takes a lot of time to do, and and uh, you know it's difficult for people to even um, bid on that stuff. Maybe. So there's different ways you can get sand on your beach. You um, you think that you can go out there and just pump it from anywhere, but again, when you go out there, it's just kind of like mud. There's little maybe deposits of sand at different places that have already been tapped. Now that's what we did at Turtle Beach. We actually pumped sand onto the beach. There's different means of extracting sand. Um, there's static static extraction, which could be like from deposits in quarries. Now there's quarries, um, you know, you basically make a big hole and you pull it out and you use, you use, um, you use the sand for your project. You remember, um, ben, you know, Benderson Lake? Okay, well that, um, you know, that used to be a, bor a borrow pit, is what they called it, and it was 
dug out and basically helped pave Fruitville Road. There's also dynamic extraction. Um, that's from seas or rivers. But when you start doing this, there's a loss of diversity, biodiversity. There's erosion, and it changes the flow of sand. There's a huge supply and demand, but there's a disparity among the sand that's still left. You know, the whole Gulf Coast of, of Florida is starved for sand, for aggregate. You know, we truck limestone, um, different things, um, from the Yucatan Peninsula and granite from the north. To, to build buildings here. Um, humans are extracting sands faster than we can keep up with. There's rapid economic growth in construction. You know, Dubai is like the world's, you know, they would have built the world's tallest building and got all kinds of money, but you know what? They, and, and they're sitting in a desert. You know where desert sand, you can't really use it for building because it's too smooth, it's too slippery, it's slick. So the, the mess of the tallest building in the world in Dubai, guess where they got their sand? Australia. They're sitting in a desert, okay? So Singapore, it's the largest uh, importer of sand. Now why do I say Singapore? Singapore has um, basically grown their country by purchasing sand from other poorer countries like Indonesia, um, Vietnam, and Thailand. So those countries are actually shrinking because they're selling their sand, while at the same time, Singapore has grown 20%. They're literally selling their country to another one. There's 24 Indonesian islands that don't exist anymore. Now let's bring this home for a minute. Um, long, uh, you have Longboat, Lido, Siesta, and Turtle. You know, Lido, um, Longboat has some hardened shoreline structures. Maybe you've read about that in the paper where there's some private lots out there that basically people, it's their own private land and they built seawalls, right? Well, the sand, once you go to seawall, it, it starts going away. So now people are walking down the beach and they hit this private land and they're like, okay, how do I? The private landowner says, well, I don't want people walking across over my land, so I'll, I'll sell it, I'll, I'll rent these for a million dollars a year to the town of Longboat. They said no, so now they got to figure out a way to go up and around it. So once you build seawalls and things, the sand <coughs> migrates away. You can pump sand in front of a seawall, but then guess what happens? It rolls and goes away again. So it's very costly once you start building and hardening your structures. Now Lido, you know, uh, Ringling and Burns, Lido was a bunch of like little islands back um, back in the day, but um, sand. Ringling took sand dredgers um, and burns. They were called mud, mud hen and sand pepper. And he, he um, basically dredged and filled in and made Lido one island. And he donated the bridge that he built and all the maintenance that comes with it to the city. Now, <laughs> there's two big passes on either side of Lido. And it kind of they kind of just want to wash Lido away. It wants to go back to how it used to be. In 20 years, or since 1965, the city or, or whoever has pumped sand on Lido Beach 20 times. Okay, so it keeps happening and it's going to keep happening. Um, now for 50 years, we pumped um, new pass and we put some on Longboat one year and the next year we put it on Lido. And they did this for 50 years for a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers. But it expired, okay? So then we went, they wanted to pump big pass. Never been pumped before, right? So they, it was in litigation for seven years. It ended up happening. Whatever um, Siesta residents didn't want it to be ruined their island. And the sand is now on Lido. But eventually, it's going to make it back into the past. Nobody knows, okay? I'm not a geologist, scientist. But eventually, it's going to go past those groins, and it's going to make it back into the past. Now, Siesta is really cool because it is one of the only beaches that has never been re -nursed. It keeps growing, matter of fact. The water used to come right up here to the dune line, and now it's like 500 feet. Now, why? Because this is called Crescent Beach, or, or it's like a, it's a curve there. Now, if you look, Lido is more like a hot dog, but Siesta is shaped more like a chicken leg. Okay? So, it washes around the corner and settles in this path, it settles in that crescent there. Now what's at the other end of Siesta is the only natural outcropping of rocks, which is live rock, point of rocks, and so it stops it there. It stops and it settles in that bowl and it keeps growing. And you got the longshore currents that are moving it 
right? And it's, it's pushing it in there. So that's why Siesta has grown in, over the years. And we've never had to pump the beach with sand or re-nourish it. And then you have turtle, which is on siesta, so why do we have to keep doing that, right? But every about seven years, we have to pump sand onto Turtle Beach. And we got sand from out in the Gulf, and you can see the difference in the quality, color, and structure, and hardness of the sand that we pumped on to Turtle. <coughs> My point is that sand is very valuable. Our beaches are getting smaller from erosion, sea level rise, and demand for places while at the same time there's a demand for these places, it's increasing, right? If you're coming to CS, if you're coming to Sarasota, you're coming to this beach, right? Like this is what it's about. This is what we enjoy. But let me tell you, when this, these are finite resources, and when they're gone, they're gone. So we need to do everything we can. It's rarer than one thinks, and we need to do everything we can to protect the sand. You know, brush it off before you get in the car. Just think about how rare the sand is. We're all fighting for that same elusive resource. You know, each community along Florida, the 825 miles of coastline, we're all fighting for the same. Woo! We're all fighting for the same sand. If you think about it, right? We want we want our beach to be renourished, and they want their beach, and it all affects. The coastline, if you take sand, it's going to affect your neighbor's beach. Remember that? So, we can use, like, you know, there's that reduce, reuse, refuse type of philosophy. Well, we can try to do things that, you know, we can um, recycle sand from buildings. It's very hard and it's cumbersome and it takes a lot of money, but it is possible. Like, when you crush a building down, you could somehow extract sand from it. We could use, simply use less sand would be one of the best means of preserving it. There's also creative ways, innovative ways that it, like you put sawdust or ash or even plastics as a portion of the aggregate into the concrete. So you're using less sand by supplementing the sand with portions of it with sawdust, ashes, or plastics. So I would say we have to protect um, everything we have here. Uh, and I'll close with some of the, um, the lines that run across the state here. There's the Coastal Construction Control Line, which is monitored by Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And it's this invisible line where you have to get a permit to build anything on this side of the line. So the state is trying to slow down development and protect the coastline as much as they can. Now, this, the county also has a line called the Gulf Beach Setback Line. And it, you know, it runs, it's like this side of the construction control line. So it's even more um, exclusive. And you have to get permits from the county. So the county is also trying to protect the shoreline from development and, and, and things like that. So maybe less coastal armory, more less building, less, you know, that sort of thing would help protect the sand and keep it where it wants to go. Thank you. Thank you again, John. Jonathan. Um, okay, now, I see all of you are taking copious notes as Jonathan was speaking. So I have some questions. And I have surprises. Um, first question, and I'm going to try to get the first hand up. You have to wait till I answer, ask the question. What sorts of things require sand as an element of production? Glass. Man. Concrete. Glass, concrete. Okay, that is, that's correct. And, yes. We have talk. Thank you. Second question. I, I thought it was came from you. Thank you. Who, and I did not know this, who is the largest importer of sand today? Sir. Singapore is correct. Thank you, sir. Who was that? Uh, young man back there. And the final question. What are at least, at least 
ways, two different ways, you can sort a sand. Ma'am? Collar and hardness. Collar and hardness. Collar and hardness is correct. Thank you very much, and now I'm going to um, introduce Catherine Wonderlick to you. Uh, to close up. Everyone, a round of applause for Jonathan Hayes. Thank you. I, I just want to give one fact. Do you know Florida has 4,500 islands? Uh, going back to that, talking about islands moving around. Think about that. 4,500 islands uh, in Florida. None of them are volcanic, by the way. What's your question? Um, when you transfer sand inland to a beach, is there any chance of cross-contamination affecting the ecosystem? Yeah, definitely. You know, when you transport sand and you bring it in, think about when you're out there vacuuming sand up, there's a whole benthic layer of biodiversity, thousands of different types of animals and critters that are under the ocean, and you're sucking them up in a vacuum cleaner, and then you're pumping it onto the beach, so you're actually suffocating, suffocating everything that's on the beach, and you're killing a lot, most of the life that is along the bottom of the ocean there, um, floor. And you're actually stirring up sediment, and which also clouds the water and like kind of chokes fish from sand gets in their gills and set up sediment like that. Yes. Is quartz from the Appalachians still a source of sand here? I'd say is quartz. The question is: Is quartz still a source of sand for from the Appalachians here? I'd say yes, but in a much slower capacity, much slower because. You know, Florida and Georgia have made uh, so many dams along the way for, for water, um, power sources, and things like that. And it's only upon the releases, occasional releases of that, that sand would come through the Mississippi Delta there into the um, Florida Gulf Coast. Well, you've been a great audience. I really appreciate you being here. Come see me. Thank you.